If we achieve orbital refilling in time, then we will launch the first uh, uncrewed uh, Starship to Mars at the end of next year. You can't really walk around on the surface of Mars, at least as yet, until Mars is terraformed to be like Earth. And then with the launching two years later, uh, we'd, we'd be sending humans. Then we progress to where we are now, Starbase 2025. So we're, we're now at the point where we can produce a ship roughly every two or three weeks. Ultimately, we're aiming for the ability to produce a thousand ships a year, so three ships a day. So that's where things are now. I'm standing in that building. And as I said, what's cool, the cool thing for those out, out there watching this video is that you can actually just literally come here, drive down the road and see it. That's our Giga Bay. So we're, we're expanding integration to produce a thousand starships per year. That'll be one of the biggest structures, I think by some measures, the biggest structure in the world. And it's designed for a thousand starships a year. We'll be making, at some point, probably as many starships for Mars as uh, Boeing and Airbus make uh, commercial airplanes. Each starship is bigger than a 747 or an A380. Like, it's truly enormous. Progress is measured by the timeline to establishing a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. That's how we're gauging our progress here at Starbase. Each launch is about learning more and more about what's needed to make life multiplanetary um, and to improve Starship to the point where it can be taking ultimately hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, to Mars. Ideally, we can take anyone who wants to go to Mars, uh, we can take to Mars. Uh, so Mars can grow by itself uh, in a worst case scenario. Uh, the fundamental fork in the road for human destiny is where, uh, we, where, where Mars can continue to grow even if the, the supply shifts from Earth stop coming for any reason. At that point, uh, we've achieved civilizational uh, resilience. Like just I think any given civilization is likely to last maybe, I don't know, 10 times longer, maybe much longer if it is a, a multi-planet civilization than if it is a single-planet civilization. Because there's always, there's always some chance that, uh, you know, us humans could do something crazy like World War III, hopefully not, but it's possible. And then we go beyond Mars, ultimately, to um, the mo maybe the asteroid belt, the moons of Jupiter, and beyond, and ultimately to other star systems. And we can be out there among the stars, making science fiction no longer fiction. So in order to achieve this goal, we have to be, we have to make rapidly reusable rockets. So it's really mind blowing that the SpaceX team has been able to catch the largest flying object ever made multiple times. I mean, have you ever seen that before? <laughs> uh, catching it in this way, which has uh, never been done before, is in order to achieve the rapidly reusable portion of the in order to make the rocket rapidly reusable. So in principle, the super heavy booster can be reflown within an hour of uh, landing. It gets caught by the tower arms, placed back in the launch mount, and then you can re refill the propellant in about 30 to 40 minutes and, and place a ship on top of it. And in principle, refly the entire booster uh, every hour. The next thing we need to do is, is catch the ship too. And then the, the ship would be placed on top of the booster and re then again uh, re re refilled with propellant and flown again. The ship is also intended to be reflown multiple times per day. So Raptor 3 uh, is designed to require no basic heat shield. So this is really a revolutionary engine. Um, you know, Raptor 3 is really, I'd say, kind of alien technology rocket engine. I mean, even industry experts, when we showed a picture of the Raptor 3, said that engine is not complete. So then we said, well, here's the engine not complete, firing uh, at a level of efficiency that has never been achieved before. So in order to make the engine like that, we had to simplify so many parts of the design, incorporate uh, secondary fluid circuits and electronics in the structure of the engine itself. Uh, so everything is contained and protected. Uh, it is uh, a marvel of engineering, frankly. Then one of the other technologies that's key for Mars is, is uh, doing orbital propellant transfer, uh, but in this case it's orbital refilling of rockets. 
which has never been done before. The two starships would get together and one starship would transfer fuel and oxygen and actually most of the mass is oxygen. It's almost 80% oxygen that gets transferred, um, a little over 20% fuel. Send a starship to orbit with uh, that's full of payload and then you send up a bunch of other starships up and you would refill the propellant on that starship. This is an important technology which uh, we should hopefully uh, demonstrate next year. Uh, one of the toughest problems to solve is the uh, reusable heat shield. Shuttle's heat shield required several months of refurbishment, basically fixing broken tiles, because it's a, an extremely hard problem uh, to, to be able to withstand the extreme heat and pressure of reentry. Uh, so this will be the first time uh, that it's done, that, that, that a reusable orbital heat shield is developed. This will, this will be something they'll be working on for a few years, I think, to, to keep honing the, the heat shield. The Mars atmosphere is carbon dioxide. When the CO2 turns into a plasma and you've got, you actually end up with more free oxygen entering on a Mars atmosphere than on Earth atmosphere. So Earth's atmosphere is only around 20% um, oxygen and uh, Mars ends up being basically more than double that, maybe triple that, um, when you consider, when the, the CO2 becomes a plasma and, uh, and, you, and you get uh, carbon and, and O2. So the, that, that wants to oxidize the heat shield, basically burn the heat shield. That's why we, uh, we, we tested very rig rigorously in a CO2 atmosphere because it's got to work not just for Earth, but also for Mars. We want to use the same heat shield for Earth that we use for Mars because there are many other factors with the heat shield, uh, such as making sure the tiles don't crack or fall off or anything like that, and be confident that when it goes to Mars, it will work. So we're developing some Next generation starships, uh, it's taller, for example, a better inter, kind of a, the interstage between the ship and the booster. Uh, a little more height here, uh, 72 meters from around 69. The booster will look a little naked on the bottom because the, uh, the Raptor 3 engines don't require a heat shield. Integrated hot stage. You can see it, the, the heat shield is sleeker. And this version, we still have six engines, but a future version will have nine. Basically, all of the ingredients necessary uh, to make life multiplanetary will be achieved with version three of Starship, which we're aiming to launch for the first time at the end of this year. Anyone who wants to move to Mars and help build a new civilization can do so. Starship will have 200 tons payload to orbit with full reusability. So you can go to Mars every two years or every 26 months. So the next Mars opportunity is at the end of next year in about 18 months. So November, December is the next Mars opportunity. So we'll try to make that opportunity if we get lucky. I think we'll probably have a 50-50 chance right now. But if we achieve orbital refilling in time, then we will launch the first uh, uncrewed uh, Starship to Mars at the end of next year. So you, you can't just go straight to Mars. You have to create this elliptical orbit with Earth at one point and Mars at the other side, at the, the far end of the ellipse, a thousand or two thousand ships, uh, you know, per Mars uh, rendezvous. That's essential. So my guess is that's about a million tons, but it might be 10 million tons. Uh, I hope it's not a hundred million tons. That'd be a lot. So we're looking at uh, different locations. Um, the lead candidate right now is the, the Arcadia region. First flights there we'll, we'll send with the Optimus robot. Um, so we can go out there and explore and, and kind of prepare the way for humans. And then with the launching two years later, uh, we'd, we'd be sending humans uh, and we'd really start building the infrastructure for Mars. Classic picture of the workers on the Empire State. And then for communications on Mars, uh, we'll be using a version of Starlink to provide uh, internet on Mars. We'll have the first humans lay the groundwork for permanent uh, presence on the surface. The goal, like I said, will be to make Mars self-sustaining as quickly as possible. Uh, my guess is we'll probably put the launch pads a little further away, um, or the landing pads, just in case. You can't really walk around on the surface of Mars, at least as yet, until Mars is terraformed to be like Earth. You need to walk around with a Mars suit. Um, and be you know, the, initially in kind of like glass domes. But it would work, um, and eventually we can make Mars into an Earth-like planet. Um, and it's also an opportunity to, I think for the Martians to, to rethink how they want civilization to be. So you can maybe rethink like what kind of form of government do you want, what new rules do you want to have, um, 
There's a lot of freedom and opportunity in Mars to do a recompile on civilization, which will be up to the Martians.